When I was a boy, there was but one permanent ambition among my comrades in our village on the west bank of the Mississippi River. That was to be a steamboatman. Oh, we had transient ambitions of other sorts, but they were only transient. When a circus came and went, it left us all burning to become clowns. The first Negro minstrel show that ever came through our section left us all suffering to try that kind of life. Now and then we hoped that if we had lived and were good, God would permit us to become pirates. But these ambitions faded out each in their own turn, but, uh, but the ambition to be a steamboatman always remained. So by and by I ran away. I said I would never come home again till I was a pilot and could come in glory. I finally got aboard an old tub called the Paul Jones, headed to New Orleans. I used this chance to get acquainted with one of the pilots and he taught me how to steer the boat, thus made the fascination of river life more potent than ever for me. I planned a siege against my pilot and at the end of three hard days he surrendered. He agreed to teach me the Mississippi River from New Orleans to St. Louis for $500, payable out of my first wages after graduating. I entered upon the small enterprise of learning 12 or 1300 miles of the great Mississippi River with the easy confidence of my time in life. If I had really known what I was about to require of my faculties, I should not have had the courage to begin. I suppose all a pilot had to do was keep his boat in the river, and I did not consider that to be much of a trick since the river was so wide. And then Mr. Bigsby caught my attention to certain things, said he, uh, this is Six Mile Point. I assented. It was pleasant enough information, but I could not see the bearing of it. I was not uh, conscious that it was a matter of any interest to me. Another time he said, uh, this is Nine Mile Point. And later he said, uh, this is Twelve Mile Point. They were all about level with the water's edge and they all looked about alike to me. They were monotonously unpicturesque. The watch ended at last and we took supper and went to bed. At midnight, a glare of a lantern shone in my eyes and the night watchman said, Come, turn out. Then he left. Well, about this time, Mr. Bigsby appeared on the scene. And something like a minute later, I was climbing the pilot house steps with some of my clothes on and Mr. Bigsby was close behind commenting. I began to fear that piloting was not quite so romantic as I, as I thought it was. It was a rather dingy night, though there were fair numbers of stars out. Presently he turned on me and he said, what's the name of the first point above New Orleans? Well, I was gratified to be able to answer promptly. I said, um, I didn't know. Don't know. Why, you are a smart one, said Mr. Bixby. What's the name of the next point? Again, I didn't know. Why, this beats anything. Tell me the name of any point or place I showed you. I studied on it a while and I decided I couldn't. Look here, what do you start out for above? Mile 12 to cross over. I, I, I don't know. Y you don't know. He was now mimicking my drawling manner of speech. Look here. What do you suppose I told you the names of them points for? I considered a moment, trembling. Then the devil of temptation provoked me to say, Well, to be entertaining, I thought. You're the stupidest dunderhead I ever saw or heard of, so help me Moses. The idea of you, you being a pilot. Why, you don't know how to pilot a cow down a lane.
Well, after a long while, I eventually crammed 1,400 miles of the Mississippi River into my little notebook, learning both ways, upstream and down, and I became a pilot. I love that profession far better than any I've followed since. I took measureless pride in it. For a pilot on a steamboat in those days was the only unfettered and entirely independent human being that walked on the earth.